السلام عليكم Good afternoon everyone. I would like to welcome you to this session where four speakers will take the floor. The biographies are found in the documents that are provided to you. The first speaker is Muhammad Al Manshawi, then Elias Bantekas, then Imad Kadura, and then Betul Dujan. So we will follow this order <coughs> of speakers. The, the topics are very intro important, uh, of course, uh, for speakers. We will give uh, each 15 to 20 minutes. Let's start with the Professor Muhammad Al Manshawi, the Congress and the Gulf States the background and determinants of the relationship. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the Arab Center. I am not a professor. I am a holder of a master's degree. I would like to talk about uh, the Congress and uh, the Gulf states uh, and uh, how uh, three countries, uh, I would be talking about Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, uh, with the certain uh, issues uh, in order to respect time and I will be as concise uh, as uh, possible because I do not have a lot of uh, time. First, uh, the relation uh, between the US and the Gulf uh, is a very complex uh, relationship um, and um, of course, the nature uh, of uh, Washington, uh, the uh, the capital Washington, uh, is uh, one uh, of the most important, or Washington is the most important for all Gulf states, uh, and it is uh, a different uh, city. It is an open city politically. It has a lot of uh, um, centers uh, of uh, power. Uh, so we can talk about the White House, uh, the President, uh, the Ministers, the Congress, uh, the media that has a very important role to, pl to play, uh, the Research uh, Center uh, as uh, well. Uh, and uh, so we can see how there are activities uh, at the uh, different levels, uh, and we can talk about uh, the uh, different uh, lobbies uh, at the United States uh, of uh, America, uh, and we can talk of the, about the big companies uh, in uh, America. Despite the fact uh, that Washington is the strongest power and its policies are important, uh, however, uh, it's like uh, it is uh, allowed uh, to have uh, a certain power in other uh, countries, and this this is something uh, that we all know and that we all realize, uh, of course, uh, and something legal for Washington to do. Uh, so um, if you really want to understand uh, how the American policy uh, acts, it's important uh, to uh, know uh, the basis upon which it depends. So. Uh, in order to understand the American uh, policy, we should understand as well the different authorities of the Congress. Uh, so there are authorities of different parties in the United States of America, but uh, uh, at certain times, uh, for example, uh, the um, roles uh, of uh, certain parties uh, might become uh, more important in comparison uh, to others. Uh, in the year 1947, uh, two institutions uh, were uh, established, uh, the CIA, Central Intelligence uh, Agency. Its president uh, is assigned directly by the President of the United States of America, in addition to the National Security Council uh, that was also established in 1947 to facilitate the activities and the works uh, of the president inside the White House, uh, their staff uh, specialized in uh, external relations uh, and other things, uh, in addition uh, to the National Security Advisor, um, because he is uh, the person who deals with the president uh, the most. So, uh, <coughs> The presidents of the United States uh, of uh, America, Kennedy, uh, Obama, and uh, so on. Three of them worked uh, as uh, senators, uh, Joe Biden, uh, Elizabeth Warren, and Bernie uh, Sanders. So um, 
If uh, one of them, um, for example, was to become uh, president, uh, of course, uh, he or she be uh, a person uh, who really understood the Congress uh, and have a good uh, relation, uh, not a confrontational uh, relation with uh, the Congress. Uh, however, uh, if uh, a president uh, comes uh, like uh, President uh, Trump from outside the political background, does not know uh, how the Congress uh, acts, does not have any friends, uh, he can be ignored ignored a lot, um, and um, the Congress uh, also, if there is any division in uh, the Congress, uh, if we take into account uh, the current situation of the Congress, uh, this might constitute a big opportunity for the, the President for uh, his role to uh, really uh, grow and become unprecedented. Uh, the Congress, for example, if it does not agree on most uh, cases, uh, so um, the uh, President uh, should play an important role uh, uh, here uh, in what concerns uh, the different policies that are adopted. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the Congress is divided uh, into uh, two uh, parties or into two uh, groups. And um, if uh, someone really understands uh, the details uh, of uh, the American uh, policy, then uh, I think uh, that uh, this uh, might be very beneficial uh, to them. Um, what about uh, the relationship uh, between uh, Washington uh, and the Gulf states? You are all experts, and we've been talking a lot about similar issues. But uh, in general, it is uh, an old uh, relation. So uh, it started between uh, a meeting between uh, Roosevelt and uh, the most important development uh, was uh, afterwards, uh, after the Iranian Revolution and the Soviet uh, invasion of Afghanistan, uh, President uh, Carter, uh, <coughs> during uh, his uh, speech, also started talking about the principle of uh, Carter, which means uh, that the U.S. has interests in the Gulf and any interest to any uh, attack on those uh, or any risk uh, posed to those uh, is considered as a risk to the United States of America. And in addition to this, uh, there is a, a U.S. Uh, umbrella to the Gulf states. I guess there are no less than uh, 35,000 uh, American uh, soldiers uh, now uh, in uh, the Gulf. So uh, in Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, UAE, and uh, Oman. So uh, 35,000 is not uh, a, a small um, number, because um, now uh, we are in a peaceful situation, and we're not facing a conflicting situation or a war. So no one um, would have imagined that uh, a big number of uh, U.S. soldiers would be sent uh, abroad. However, this happened uh, in uh, Kuwait uh, first. Uh, what about uh, the uh, other aspects of this uh, relationship? It is a bilateral relationship uh, between uh, two different uh, countries. Uh, most um, members of the Congress uh, look at the Gulf uh, as one region. So. Um, they focus uh, a lot uh, on um, foreign policies, uh, on everything that is related uh, to foreign uh, policy. And uh, if, uh, and of course, they focus uh, as well uh, on the issues that are related uh, to the Middle East uh, or to the Gulf. And uh, this is uh, something that is complex uh, for the Congress, uh, and it's uh, easy uh, to affect it uh, if uh, there is uh, a lobby that is uh, s uh, smart. Uh, um, what about uh, this bilateralism in dealing with the United States uh, of America? It is very difficult. Uh, there's a very big military cooperation. Um, between both, between the Gulf states and the U.S., and at the same time, uh, there are uh, as well uh, bilateral uh, uh, drills, uh, military uh, drills uh, with Washington, and all Gulf states uh, are seeking uh, to really maintain uh, this uh, mutual uh, relationship. They consider it as a special uh, relationship. What about uh, the general framework of the relationship between the U.S. Uh, and uh, the Gulf states? Uh, there are a lot of aspects to be taken into consideration. So uh, first, uh, we can uh, say uh, that um, 
There are three cases that we can talk about uh, before uh, Trump uh, acceded uh, to power. There's, uh, for example, uh, the case uh, of the port uh, of uh, Dubai, uh, and uh, there's also the law that was uh, um, amended, or actually that was uh, adopted. These uh, cases uh, should have really taught uh, the Gulf uh, capitals uh, how to deal uh, with uh, the Congress. Uh, so for uh, different uh, reasons, uh, I do not um, believe that uh, everything was understood very well. Uh, and Boeing uh, also um, performed the role uh, of uh, lobbying. So the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was able uh, to exploit uh, these gaps uh, and the deal was uh, achieved uh, even in what concerns uh, the people who were working in these companies, this is what happened. Uh, in what concerns the port of Beirut, there was an American company that was competing uh, with Dubai. It did lobbying and it did link uh, the UAE to terrorism. Uh, there were uh, two uh, Emiratis who participated in the 9-11. And what concerns the just um, law, as we said, uh, um, the Congress uh, uh, played a role despite the fact that the veto was used uh, by President Obama in this case, the case of the just uh, law. The second important aspect uh, in uh, the relationship between any state uh, to the Congress uh, is uh, the following. Uh, we should uh, think uh, if uh, <coughs> there are uh, big uh, ex uh, groups of expatriates in the United States of America. No, uh, there are uh, no big numbers. Uh, there are no um, lobbyists. Most countries uh, who have a friendly relationship with the United States of uh, America uh, prefer to have uh, a good relationship with the United States of America. And now if we want uh, to um, talk about France, about uh, Germany, Japan, even China, um, so uh, all of those uh, have uh, a focus inside the Congress, uh, but not uh, Gulf states. Uh, and uh, there are no uh, members of the Congress uh, that really adopted uh, this uh, same uh, trajectory. And uh, we can say uh, that uh, in what concerns uh, this relationship uh, between uh, the Congress uh, and uh, the Gulf states, uh, the general uh, um, uh, situation uh, is uh, a pessimistic situation, it's a dark situation, and um, the image uh, is uh, bad after uh, the 9-11 attacks, uh, and uh, tensions are everywhere. Uh, and uh, in addition to the fact uh, that uh, there is a race uh, in the Gulf uh, that focuses uh, on the Congress and the United States uh, of America. So this is something that should be taken into account uh, despite the fact uh, that they are competing uh, on the same individuals, on the same tools. And the last point is the following. An authority like uh, the Congress uh, um, is a, uh, an, an authority that uh, is uh, always thought of uh, by the different uh, Gulf uh, states. Of course, uh, President uh, Trump uh, is a different president. Uh, if we take all criteria into consideration, he's uh, from outside uh, the political uh, circle. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to uh, really uh, expect uh, what he will be doing or how will he will be acting. And uh, I think that the Gulf states were very happy that uh, President Trump uh, acceded uh, to power in the White House. And uh, I do believe uh, that the fact that he is uh, a businessman uh, really um, is uh, something uh, important and uh, interesting uh, um, because he is a businessman and maybe they think that uh, because of that and thanks to that they might be able to affect his decisions especially business related <coughs> decisions So you know also how he acted towards uh, Iran. Um, uh, you know also how his opinion was uh, regarding uh, the Arab uh, Spring. In addition, his logic is one of uh, bargains and deals. And this was the case uh, even under President uh, Barack Obama. 
So uh, his main focus is on deals, and that was also partly the focus of President Barack Obama, and this was uh, widely welcomed by Gulf uh, capitals. But as I've already said, President Trump is uh, unpredictable. His stances are unpredictable, and he's crazy, and he can easily change his uh, positions depending on his personal relations. How uh, do the uh, uh, Gulf countries deal with the Congress? Uh, they go for uh, traditional uh, deals and workings both directly and indirectly. There are frequent uh, visits. Uh, there are also quotas in different uh, committees. For instance, we can see here in one of the uh, pictures the Emir of Qatar with uh, the uh, um, uh, chairman of the House. We have another picture of uh, picture of the Crown Prince uh, of the UAE. So uh, this is the traditional approach. Many capitals operate uh, in the U.S. Uh, to support the influence of this or that uh, country with the Congress. But actually, the spread changes. Uh, uh, there is uh, a one-man plus uh, embassies where the ambassador does everything as the case uh, for uh, the UAE ambassador. There are smaller embassies like the Embassy of Qatar. Its role has increased after the Gulf crisis. There are other embassies that have a deep legacy, as the case of the Saudi embassy. This was very obvious in the Gulf crisis. Actually, there was a silent battle between the embassy of Qatar facing four other embassies, including the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Egypt. So there was a diplomatic imbalance. And uh, there were uh, four embassies working against uh, one embassy. There was no um, no balance at that time, but uh, this was uh, compensated for with uh, lobbies. In addition, lobbies play an indirect role. As you know, the lobbies can be influential in the U.S. Uh, capital. Usually, the lobbies uh, through embassies ask uh, for the announcement of a series of activities undertaken, and this is obvious. Uh, what is the size of uh, spending on lobbies in the past uh, three years? Uh, this, uh, these are the official figures from the Department of Justice. Saudi Arabia had a lion's share, uh, followed by the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Depending on its interests, uh, Qatar also before uh, the uh, crisis, uh, the funding was insignificant, uh, but uh, this has changed after the crisis, as you can see in the figures. Uh, the uh, number has increased, and now there is uh, a greater balance in the relationship uh, between uh, Qatar and the Congress uh, and uh, Washington, on the other hand. I believe uh, we will have to check uh, to see if that trend uh, will continue towards the end of the year. I'm talking about uh, a, a figure in millions, uh, but these are the official figures provided by the Department of Justice. Uh, what are the targets of the lobby in favor of Saudi Arabia in the past two years? As I've already said, every uh, lobby registers uh, every email at the Department of Justice, any request for interview. So uh, when they uh, make uh, interviews, uh, when they send uh, delegations uh, to the region, all of this is registered. This is legal. And uh, this is uh, an indication of the lobby activity, the official lobby activity in favor of Saudi Arabia, as you uh, can see. Uh, this has a focus mostly on the senators, and there was uh, uh, a focus of 65 percent in 2010. 17. The number dropped uh, slightly in 2018. This is a concentration of lobbies uh, working in favor of Saudi Arabia and Washington. Uh, the lobby uh, working for uh, the UAE, uh, these are the figures in front of you. There was much focus on the Congress. Uh, around 84 percent of activities was, in f was uh, focused on the Congress, uh, unlike the case for Saudi Arabia. Uh, the lobby working in favor of uh, Qatar, the figures are not uh, announced. Actually, the study will be released in uh, three months. And uh, the data is not yet available for Qatar because uh, Qatar was late in uh, relying on uh, lobby. So uh, my source uh, will release the figures uh, for Qatar in uh, February uh, 2020, yeah, i.e. in uh, three months. I believe uh, the figures will be almost consistent with those uh, for uh, the UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, 
so these are more broadly the indirect uh, methods. I spoke about the direct methods, including uh, lobbies, embassies, and visits. But there are also the indirect uh, means, and there are the most important. This happens through influentials, uh, through research centers, uh, through think tanks, and also by uh, supporting some uh, already existing think tanks. Research centers are very important uh, because usually people also have uh, testimonies and hearings before the uh, Congress. They ex uh, they publish their op-eds, their opinion articles, and uh, they are very influential, and their opinion could be also uh, of uh, use during investigation and also before during healing sessions. The UAE launched the Arab Center. Uh, Saudi Arabia launched Arabia Foundation. Uh, Qatar has uh, founded at least uh, two such uh, centers, and we have also uh, Qatar U American Center, and Qatar also supported another institute in Brookings and uh, others. And this is a sample of uh, the activities conducted by the UAE uh, ambassador. Uh, this is a part of their activity over the past uh, three years. Uh, the orange uh, re represent the Congress. So the uh, UAE ambassador, when he took over, relied on uh, Thomas, uh, who was uh, the head of protocol under uh, President George Bush. He is well connected across uh, Washington. And uh, um, they were able to uh, put the UAE ambassador in touch with uh, several media outlets. They also relied on Eric Brutley, who is uh, uh, head uh, chairman of the Finance Committee in the Republican, who was also very influential. He organized uh, two uh, conferences, and this uh, was uh, a very useful approach also. And they also brought several senior congressmen to participate uh, in the conference. Also, the most important thing is their investment in the young generation and the youth. So they invested in three people. I believe if you do a Google research, uh, you will find it. Uh, there is uh, Eric Grider from the US uh, uh, Research Center. And uh, the uh, for so they relied on uh, many influential people, including uh, Yusuf. He was also uh, active uh, within the Congress. There is also another uh, person, Bilal Saab. He is a researcher. And we have a leaked email of, uh, with Yusuf. And uh, this explained uh, the connections he had. There is also Hajar Al Awad. He is also an important lobby within the Congress. The three Gulf uh, countries also uh, launch uh, uh, embellishment campaigns uh, within the US. Uh, so we are talking here about embellishment uh, policies. They spoke with Ted Cruz and others. They talk about uh, religious reform. And uh, they uh, tell the Americans uh, the discourse they like to hear. And also Qatar has many donations in Texas. The same applies uh, to uh, the UAE. We have the Children's Hospital and so on. So all three capitals uh, uh, try to coax the public opinion of the US. And uh, both uh, all the three countries have uh, very good friends, particularly amongst uh, the uh, big uh, weapons uh, companies. And also, after uh, the crisis, there was a proposal to uh, suspend uh, any arms sales uh, to the three Gulf countries. The White House objected, and also companies rejected this uh, proposal. And the proposal did not uh, advance and go forward, because it was in the interest of them all uh, for the companies to continue their arms sales there it's not clear what uh, future strategy will be adopted in dealing with the Congress and how the U.S. will change its relationship with the Gulf countries. The Washington is no longer interested in providing protection to the Gulf uh, countries uh, regarding the security of maritime navigation. Uh, where Trump has already said that the U.S will not alone bear this uh, responsibility. In addition, uh, there is a loss of interest. The earlier red line was the intervention in the U.S. policy. The Mueller report showed that the UAE intervened in the election. This is a red line. So you can lobby, but you cannot meddle in the U.S. Uh, internal affairs. And this uh, could be costly for the UAE in the uh, medium and uh, long term. Another risk is uh, MBS and his uh, ongoing uh, criticism of, uh, of uh, Trump in his uh, 60 minutes interview with uh, Bloomberg. This was a case in point. This was another reaction uh, to the problem in Yemen. 
So the three major Democrats uh, have uh, tried to make tr peace with the uh, uh, with the Gulf countries. Actually, the three Gulf countries are losing because they are losing from the uh, from uh, from the policies in place. The lobbies are struggling. Uh, and, and I believe that the government support uh, they are getting will uh, not uh, be in their favor unless the three lobbies uh, come together. There's also another uh, an OPEC that is against uh, OPEC and that wants to control oil prices and to dominate uh, oil and gas. And of course, this requires cooperation from Gulf countries to have one voice in the Congress. And this is not the case to date. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. In the last 10 minutes, uh, you have uh, provided us uh, with interesting information, and that's why I couldn't stop you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Elias Bantekat. You are uh, a professor of international law and arbitration at HBKU. You will talk about engaging the UN Security Council in the embargo against Qatar. Having been here a year and a half, I thought uh, I would of change from my research and look at issues affecting Qatar, and one of these being the, uh, the blockade against Qatar. So as a, as a lawyer, um, I wanted to see what means were available to, uh, to make uh, public the debate about, about the blockade. So uh, my, my good colleague Mohammed talked about some of the uh, lobbying efforts, and this is all part um, um, of one larger effort, but I would like to make a distinction between um, uh, looking at the issue both as a political problem but as a legal problem. So some of these sometimes are intertwined and it's not easy to separate. If you went to a law firm and you said, how do we deal with this problem? They would take the politics and they would make it turn into a legal problem. And the reason why they would do that is because that's what they know. So they would take, they would go to every forum available and they would bring a lawsuit against the government or entities concerned. Uh, and Qatar has done that. Now, one of the biggest issues why this has been done, I think, you know, in a way it's futile. You're not going to get anything from that, but you do get public attention. Uh, and one of the, in the last 10, 20 years, there's a new uh, um, methodology that's come up, and it's called lawfare. So conducting warfare through law. And we see that, you know, throughout the world against leaders being uh, arraigned on criminal charges uh, in Europe. And so you're not going to get them, but at least they are, there's an indictment against them, there's possibility of extradition, and so therefore the likelihood of international travel has been diminished. And we saw that with, um, with al-Bashir. So although he had support <laughs> Now it's gone now. So although he had support from the African Union, it made it difficult for him to travel anywhere. And that was one of the reasons why he also came, uh, um, came down. Um, now, why is it important that a country like Qatar in this, in this crisis uh, resort to the uh, UN Security Council rather than going through exhausting uh, legal avenues? Uh, the reason is that the Security Council, as you all know, is the major forum where something is either dealt with and resolved or not at all. And you can't do that by going through the International Court of Justice, or treaty bodies within the United Nations. You can make the problem public, but you can never really resolve it. Now, the Security Council in the last 20 years or 30 years has been able to uh, dig deep into the Middle East. And so even starting with Resolution 678 in 1990, in the aftermath of the uh, first Gulf War, and this is a resolution that's still uh, live. So Resolution 678, said that the Security Council may authorize the use of force in the Gulf region without an end date uh, to avert uh, any uh, uh, future calamity in the region. So there's no end date. Uh, there's no territorial uh, um, um, end to all of this. So effectively, the Security Council, since 1990, could use force uh, in the entire region of the Middle East, you know, including uh, uh, Iran as well, uh, for any security threat. So this is still alive. Now this means that Qatar could somehow engage into all of this. Uh, I don't have any solutions, but I can just you know, provide some, some questions uh, to get the discussion going as well. Um, now, a few years ago, especially at the, in the beginning of the crisis, 
the Security Council uh, never took up the issue of Qatar, and it's never been discussed, even indirectly. And in fact, when the, uh, the Chinese delegate to the Security Council was asked what would happen with this issue, he said that this is a regional issue. It doesn't raise security issues at the moment, so therefore the parties must resolve this on their own. But clearly, the Security Council and none of its members want to agitate any of the parties within the blockade dispute. They all have alliances within, within, you know, within the parties themselves, and the Security Council in the last you know, 10 years has been dealing with issues a lot more important. Uh, um, security threats in Yemen, in Syria, uh, in the Horn of Africa, um, you name it, throughout the world. And even now with its own members being embroiled in conflict, as in the case of Ukraine uh, with, uh, with Russia. So therefore, there is absolutely no possibility for the Security Council to touch the issue of the blockade uh, uh, directly. So the only way that this can be addressed is through indirect means. Now, lobbying is one of those issues, so sensitivizing the uh, public opinion in countries that are permanent members of the Security Council. But at the same time, it's also not worthy to, to ask whether or not indirectly the Security Council can take some action. And by indirectly, I'm referring to using existing situations to make reference to the blockade. I'm going to use just three. So I'm going to use the, um, uh, the post-678 resolution regime, so the uh, Iraq and, and Kuwait and the broader Middle East um, issue, the situation in Yemen, which again has come under Security Council uh, control, and also international terrorism. Um, in all of these three situations, there is some involvement of either the UAE, Saudi Arabia, or Qatar in the relevant resolutions, in the discussions. Uh, in all of these cases, Qatar could make a point that it's in the interest of the Security Council, because these are complex issues, that certain aspects, so the minor aspects building up to the greater issue, be resolved. Not necessarily through a, a um, concrete action, but through recommendation. So a Security Council resolution may take a very binding stance towards something. For example, it might say, uh, member states may use force to resolve the situation. That's something which is very concrete and, and very sharp. But at the same time, the Security Council may use language which is hortatory or recommendatory. So in this case, the Security Council might say that in order to avert humanitarian disaster in Yemen, it's in the interest of the regional parties to resolve their disputes first. And by doing so, the Security Council then recommends that mediation be offered to resolve dispute. Uh, between Qatar and its neighbors. That hasn't been on the table yet, but it's something that could happen in, as an intermediary step to resolve a greater issue. So how that can be inserted in the discussion, I think it's a matter of, of, of lobbying both at the uh, Security Council level, but also at the, uh, at the public opinion level. Um, again, international terrorism is a, is a significant issue because it's on the Security Council agenda every year. And the major issue here is about terrorist financing. And as you all know, the Security Council maintains a number of sanctions committees uh, that looks at terrorist financing. Again, Qatar has been at the forefront of trying to eliminate any, uh, any, any even uh, indirect involvement with, with any of this. Um, for good reason, Qatar, uh, two years ago, um, gave a consultancy to a law firm in Texas. And I'm surprised you mentioned Texas before. Uh, I don't know what the Texas connection is, but uh, this was a law firm which is owned by the former general uh, attorney of the United States, uh, Richard Ashcroft, and so there was a consultancy about $3 million to, uh, and, the, and, the, and the purpose was to uh, increase the visibility and draw up the new terrorist financing legislation of Qatar, which I think is very important because it shows that, listen, if the general attorney of the United States is taking up this contract, then therefore you know, we have, you know, we, we are trying to do everything that we can to avoid even the slightest accusation of being involved or having uh, our system open to terrorist financing. So I think all these, all these ways, uh, that indirect ways of trying to get issues through the Security Council as smaller issues as part of a bigger problem uh, is, I think, a significant way that the Qatari Foreign Office would think about uh, engaging Security Council in its current uh, dispute with its neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.
In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, I would like to talk about Turkey and uh, the Gulf. I would like to focus on one aspect of this uh, broad uh, subject. Of course, uh, this is uh, an issue of interest to all. I will only focus on one aspect, which is the influence of mutual conceptions on current relations. What, uh, when I talk about mutual conceptions or uh, perceptions, I mean the need uh, for each uh, party to understand uh, the other party and then to work uh, to promote uh, bilateral relations in order to achieve interests and uh, common uh, perceptions. This is the current state of affairs. Of course, uh, the economy can be a major uh, interest uh, for one party or the other. But uh, at the same time, this could, uh, the conceptions or the perceptions could also mean uh, concerns or uh, negative historical experiences between the two parties, uh, such as uh, the uh, Saudi-Ottoman dispute of the 19th century. This, in turn, could have a negative impact on the bilateral relations in current uh, times or could uh, build psychological barriers that would hinder further improvement of uh, relations. Most of, uh, um, in most uh, cases than not, those uh, preconceptions uh, are conjured up uh, in uh, different uh, situations. In my current uh, uh, research, I would I explain that the UAE and Saudi Arabia, for instance, disagree significantly with uh, Turkey on some regional issues, but uh, their uh, current uh, perceptions uh, and uh, and uh, their economic relations are good. For instance, the UAE. Um, uh, uh, the UAE uh, uh, Turkish really, uh, trade relationship amounts to $14 billion, which is a huge amount. Uh, preconceptions also uh, mean a positive uh, perception. This perception can also be negative uh, currently, but nonetheless, the relationship continues. In a brief, and without going back to an overview of uh, Turkey's relationship with the Arab world uh, and particularly with the Gulf world, which were an extension of uh, the relations with the Arab world in the 20s, uh, Turkey's relationship with the Gulf countries has uh, largely developed, uh, particularly under the rule of the AKP. This uh, was uh, mainly ascribed to a key reason, including the economic crisis in Turkey. This crisis was partly uh, the outcome of the weak uh, coalition governments uh, in the 90s. So uh, the Turks needed a strong uh, party that uh, would uh, end uh, this economic crisis. Therefore, the Justice and Development Party, when it was established in 2002, gave uh, unprecedented momentum to relations with Arab countries, Arab Gulf countries, this was the first uh, time that uh, Turkey opened up uh, to uh, Arab Gulf uh, countries with uh, this uh, momentum. Collectively, Turkey uh, tried to expand its relations with the uh, Gulf uh, countries. It signed a memorandum of understanding in 2005. Uh, this uh, memorandum of understanding aimed uh, to improve uh, uh, cultural energy and educational cooperation. Uh, this uh, uh, was seen as a prelude to developing political, military, and defense uh, relations uh, at a later uh, stage. In 2008, both uh, parties signed another memorandum of uh, understanding. GCC uh, perceived uh, Turkey as a strategic partner. This was the first time that a, sta a non-Gulf state was uh, given such a status. This was a step uh, towards uh, developing security, military, and economic relations. Both parties also launched uh, a mechanism for strategic dialogue. This was a strategic uh, senior uh, uh, mechanism. It was launched in 2008. Uh, uh, Meetings were conducted uh, for uh, five uh, consecutive years from 2008 to uh, 2012. Meetings later became less frequent. Uh, uh, meetings were held in 2016, but not after that because of a series of different uh, perceptions. Turkey also uh, tried to approach uh, or to come closer to the Gulf. It uh, signed the Istanbul uh, Initiative for Cooperation in 2004. Four Gulf countries joined in 2006. And 
and they became a NATO uh, partner. Saudi Arabia did not join alongside Oman. With respect to bilateral relations, uh, Turkey began developing its strategic relations with some Gulf countries. It signed such agreement in Qatar with 2007 and in 2012, uh, different uh, agreements for cooperation in training and uh, uh, military manufacturing uh, were uh, concluded. In addition, a military base was established. This was the culmination of this agreement. Uh, the last uh, such uh, a meeting of the higher uh, uh, Qatari a Turkish uh, meeting was uh, held on last 26 November. With uh, Saudi Arabia, both uh, parties in 2015 decided to establish a senior mechanism for uh, dialogue and uh, cooperation. In April 2016, they established uh, the uh, Saudi-Turkish uh, cooperation uh, Coordination Council. In 2011, in early 2011, there was talk about an investment of uh, 6 billion riyals in uh, Turkey over a period of uh, 12 years when uh, the conceptions and uh, perceptions were aligned. And when they have a positive, when they had positive uh, perceptions of each other in Kuwait. Uh, with the Kuwait, uh, agreements were signed in 2017 and 2018, covering military cooperation between both parties. In addition, as I've already said, Turkey has advanced uh, economic relations with the UAE. In other words, there is a, a positive mutual perception between both sides. Uh, but uh, despite uh, these uh, strategic and commercial relations uh, over the past uh, few years, the, the relations uh, politically receded, particularly with the, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain, but uh, the political relations with Qatar improved. Why uh, there was this rapprochement and strategic partnership with Qatar, but not with other uh, Gulf uh, countries? It's because of the mutual conceptions and perceptions. Perceptions can play a positive or a negative role. Mm, uh, this also depends on the party's perceptions of uh, current uh, developments, not only historical uh, developments. So uh, some may see Turkey as a threat or as an opportunity. For instance, this also, uh, um, like uh, the Arab Spring, is a new issue. There were different perceptions and also political Islam, the threat to the current status quo, and also the position on the Gulf crisis. So these uh, represent different uh, conceptions. There were also mu uh, historical conceptions that uh, had also an, um, an impact because they are usually conjured up in times of crisis. Uh, one such conception is the Ottoman uh, presence in the Gulf and also the Ottomans' uh, departure from the Medina. So these uh, historical uh, conceptions are sometimes uh, conjured up. These uh, fluctuating uh, relations require from us uh, further analysis. With respect to uh, Turkey, there are uh, two uh, decisive uh, factors uh, that uh, impact uh, Turkey's perception of the Gulf as uh, important. Uh, one is the strategic depth. Another element uh, is the uh, economy, and it's as important as uh, strategic depth. Strategic depth is important. Uh, the Justice and Development Party perceive uh, the Gulf as part of uh, Turkey's geographical space, and it's an area where Turkey can uh, play a role. Uh, the uh, Justice and Development Party governments have always tried to capitalize on uh, Turkey's historical and religious uh, relations uh, with uh, countries that were under the Ottoman Empire influence. As uh, such, uh, Turkey believes uh, that it shares with uh, Muslim uh, countries geographical uh, connectedness, uh, proximity, um, uh, Islamic um, solidarity, and uh, a joint faith. This requires from Turkey to reinforce its relationship with uh, these countries, uh, according uh, to Turkish uh, analysts uh, that were interviewed. Uh, so there were around uh, 20 interviewed between uh, Turkish people uh, and uh, people from the Gulf. According to Turkish analysts, uh, Turkey is participating uh, or actually has the same religion like Gulf states. And there are a lot of different uh, cultural uh, common points uh, that uh, are based uh, on the common religion. Uh, this 
this uh, is in what uh, in relation uh, to the strategic dimension someone also also thinks that Turkey should develop its relation with all the countries that were under the Ottoman Empire and if uh, it wants uh, to reinforce its force and power in the Middle East it should uh, improve its uh, relationships with the Gulf states because it is in need of their cooperation in order to achieve its uh, objectives and others also uh, felt that these uh, common points are not enough in order to put an end to all differences in what concerns identity and policy. Ahmed Dawood Oglu was uh, clear in uh, his uh, vision regarding uh, the uh, Gulf. Um, so um, that's why uh, uh, the concept uh, of uh, strategic depth is very important for Dawood Oglu, and he talked about uh, the important uh, sea basins uh, uh, of uh, f that are important for Turkey, like uh, the Caspian Sea, like uh, the Gulf of uh, Basra, and like the Arab Gulf, uh, among uh, many others. So as a result uh, of uh, this, um, uh, of having realized how much uh, the, the Gulf is important at a strategic uh, level, uh, Turkey uh, should develop uh, its uh, strategic link uh, with other countries. However, some other parties might say that despite uh, the uh, roles uh, of uh, Turkey at the level of uh, the international relations and foreign relations, however, it is still a medium-sized uh, force that is in need of alliances and coalitions in the region with big powers in order to be able uh, to play an important role in the region, and therefore it is in need of the force uh, and the power of the Gulf in order to be able to reinforce uh, the balance of power in the region uh, in a way that is in its interest uh, especially in what concerns its um, oil and financial uh, power. The second conception regarding the Gulf uh, is the economy, and we'll talk about it very fast. Uh, so um, the economy in Turkey and uh, in the Gulf uh, uh, is <coughs> important. The GDP in Turkey uh, is uh, known until the year 2018. Uh, it's um, $909 billion, and it is ranked uh, 17th, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, it is ranked uh, 18th. Uh, in what concerns uh, the Gulf, uh, we can say, uh, if you take into consideration the six uh, countries, um, one billion four hundred million dollars. Uh, so Qatar is uh, at uh, the uh, 54th uh, rank in comparison also with the other uh, Gulf uh, countries. Uh, the two parties uh, or the two countries uh, have uh, complementary um, <coughs> economic uh, structures uh, that uh, because the Gulf states uh, have uh, oil and gas and uh, consumer markets, uh, the Turkish economy is based uh, on industry and agriculture. It is in need uh, of this uh, consumer market. Uh, the deception uh, that the Turkish uh, people uh, felt regarding the full membership in the European Union led to its reinforcement of relationship with uh, other alternatives or actually the diversification of its uh, relations like Gulf states. Uh, the vision of uh, 2023 played a very big uh, role uh, in um, moving uh, Turkey towards uh, uh, focusing on Gulf states and other countries as well. But Gulf states are important in order to attract uh, capital because they are in need of uh, increasing uh, their exports by 500 or to 500 billion dollars. Now uh, it's 156 billion dollars. Of course, uh, Turkey imports uh, around 98% uh, uh, of uh, natural gas and is in need uh, uh, of really diversifying its partner in gas. Uh, it uh, depends uh, a lot uh, on uh, Russia. Uh, at a rate uh, of 58% uh, and on Iran as well. It is seeking to diversify its partners uh, through the Gulf uh, states. And now we can say that Qatar has now uh, started uh, to provide uh, Turkey with around 25% uh, uh, of uh, liquefied gas. In addition to this, uh, Turkey imports 94% uh, um, uh, of uh, well, and uh, Turkey is in need uh, of increasing the contributions uh, of uh, Gulf states in the imports uh, of uh, oil and gas. Turkey is ambitious and wants uh, to become a center uh, of uh, energy and energy hub uh, and to move that uh, from Iran, from Gulf states, uh, from uh, Russia um, to the European market. So now, and in what concerns uh, Gulf states, uh, uh, I would try to be as fast as possible to uh, respect time regarding the Arab Gulf states. There's 
there's also another uh, conception that uh, Turkey is a very big uh, economic power that we can benefit from, and it is uh, an emanating uh, economic uh, force that has benefits and costs at the same time. Uh, for the economy, uh, economic diversification is considered central in the policies of the Gulf, and Turkey is a developing country that is trying to benefit uh, from uh, its relations with Gulf states. And we can say that from 2000 until 2018, um, the uh, commercial um, deals between Turkey and the Gulf uh, multiplied uh, by more than 20 times. So uh, in the year 2018, it reached around 1 billion. There are uh, big investments uh, in uh, Turkey that are in the interest of Gulf states, uh, especially Qatari investments uh, that might reach uh, around 20 uh, billion uh, dollars. And now, and in what concerns the second conception, the Gulf states consider Turkey as a regional power, um, and there is uh, the will to benefit from this uh, power, and there is a fear from its expanding powers and its national uh, competing uh, agenda, which means uh, that there is uh, a will by the Gulf states to create uh, a coalition uh, with Turkey in order uh, uh, to face uh, the power of Iran, uh, and uh, Gulf states did not uh, uh, also agree on the role of Turkey in the region. Uh, regarding the mutual uh, conception uh, of Gulf states uh, towards uh, Turkey, many transformations uh, affected uh, the conception um, and uh, looking at Turkey as a possible uh, ally of uh, Gulf states. And we can talk here most importantly about uh, the Iranian element uh, that constitutes uh, a risk uh, for Gulf states uh, since the Shah was uh, overthrew and uh, his uh, uh, system or his uh, regime. Uh, so Gulf states uh, are uh, really uh, afraid uh, uh, and really worry that uh, their uh, regimes and uh, systems uh, would be uh, affected. The invasion of Iraq uh, as well shed the light uh, on the control of uh, Shia parties in Iraq. Uh, the power of Iran uh, increased in Iraq and with the Arab Spring, uh, it has become uh, clear. Uh, I'm talking here about uh, the power uh, in uh, Yemen uh, and uh, in other countries. So Turkey is considered as a possible partner and ally, and it is starting uh, expressing uh, its fears uh, towards uh, the uh, power of Iran. Uh, there are statements uh, from Erdogan uh, towards uh, Iran, uh, and they are unprecedented. Uh, in fact, uh, he uh, described the execution uh, of the Shia Saudi in 2016 as if uh, it is an internal Saudi matter, and he also accused Iran in 2015 of seeking uh, to control the region after uh, the control of the Houthis uh, in uh, Yemen. And there are uh, statements uh, by uh, Oglo that Iran uh, is adopting uh, confession-related uh, policies. During this period, Gulf states started looking at Turkey, describing it as a possible um, ally. And uh, there have been talks uh, about uh, the Sunni camp, despite the fact that it is uh, unreal. Uh, what about uh, the different conceptions of Gulf states? They're very different from Turkey. So there are uh, differences between uh, the conceptions of KS, UAE, and Bahrain from one hand, and Qatar and other countries from other hands, in addition to Oman and Kuwait. For uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, there is a, a historical uh, continuous uh, conception that uh, is always adopted by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia towards Turkey. It is uh, related to the establishment of the first uh, Ottoman uh, state at the hand of Abdullah bin uh, Saud and how he ally, uh, built ally alliances uh, with uh, some uh, Others, uh, in addition uh, to the role uh, of uh, Murad al Raba, uh, Murad uh, the fourth one, he sent uh, the uh, army of uh, Muhammad Ali to uh, Al Madina and ended uh, the uh, Saudi control over it, and then uh, the uh, Ottoman uh, control uh, on the headquarters uh, of uh, Prince Abdullah bin Saud uh, in the year 1818. So uh, the Saudis uh, used uh, to uh, see in uh, Turks uh, that uh, they are creative uh, people, and this uh, uh, 
uh, thanks uh, to uh, the conceptions uh, that uh, they adopt. Uh, and Turkish people look at Saudis uh, as if uh, uh, they are obstacles and that there is a, um, a, rebel a rebellion that should be oppressed. Uh, so this conception remained uh, a continuous psychological uh, obstacle that shows every time uh, during crisis as we witnessed in 2017 and 2016. And some researchers in Saudi Arabia says uh, that the uh, Turkish-Saudi relations are still affected uh, by the uh, problems uh, from the past because uh, Turkey, or this is how we understand it, is still acting as if uh, it is uh, the one who has the upper hand. Uh, there's the operation Asif al Hazm in the year 2015 was very clear, despite the fact uh, that uh, Turkey uh, was really prepared So Turkey was really prepared uh, to support uh, the alliance. However, uh, there is uh, a Saudi willingness uh, to reduce the role of Turkey to the maximum. And in addition to this, uh, there is a Saudi willingness uh, for it not to be uh, within a coalition that is under uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The United uh, So uh, Turkey sorry, started uh, like uh, having an important role in the Arab world. And the UAE thinks uh, that there are certain uh, extremist ideologies uh, that uh, are uh, being clearer day after uh, day. Uh, and uh, these countries also consider that the Arab Spring can present to Turkey an opportunity uh, for it uh, to expand its powers uh, through building an alliance with Islamic parties and even liberal parties uh, that started really acceding uh, to power were since the year 2012 and that's why the revolutions uh, in the Arab world are seen as um, uh, problems. However, Turkey considers those uh, as uh, opportunities. And uh, also uh, we can talk about the relation uh, with the Muslim uh, Brotherhood uh, despite the fact that Turkey uh, thinks that uh, it is supporting uh, democracy and not necessarily the Islamic uh, movement. The uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia also considers that the active participation of Egypt uh, uh, during uh, the reign uh, of the Muslim uh, Brotherhood is to be taken into account and the rapprochement between Mursi and Iran will serve uh, the interests of the competitors of the Kingdom uh, of Saudi Arabia. Of of course, uh, the Gulf crisis uh, is uh, concerned. The fact that Turkey um, is supporting uh, Qatar or supported Qatar is uh, considered as one of the reasons that uh, Lili established um, certain conceptions uh, about Turkey and uh, therefore the United Arab Emirates KSA and Bahrain in addition uh, to Egypt uh, focus uh, on uh, the Turkish basis uh, in Qatar considering it uh, um, as uh, something uh, in interesting. Uh, so uh, do you know that in the year 2016, Fakhri Basha, the Turkish, uh, committed uh, a crime uh, against a certain city. They stole their money. These are the people uh, working for Erdogan. Ibrahim Kalam answered this tweet. He is uh, the spokesperson for Mr. Erdogan, and he also said Fahreddin Pasha was the one uh, who really uh, defended uh, the city courageously against uh, the British plans. So this is one of the uh, latest examples to these conceptions uh, that still show during the uh, crisis um, and uh, we can talk here uh, also about uh, the um, series uh, Mamalik uh, al Nar, the kingdoms uh, of uh, fire that was considered by Yasin uh, Akhtan the vice president of the defense uh, development and justice party as if um, um, uh, so this is what he says about them he says uh, that uh, so uh, so he, he said that his opinion about that and he talks about different examples and uh, about how they affect uh, on the uh, current uh, relationships. Uh, 
so uh, regarding Qatar, United Arab Emirates, uh, actually Qatar, Oman, and uh, Kuwait, I do not have uh, more time to talk about those, uh, but hopefully, uh, maybe later on in the Q&A session, we'll be able to answer these questions more and more. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Imad. Of course, uh, Professor Imad uh, can also um, talk uh, more during the Q&A uh, session. Uh, I will give you more space uh, uh, for you to talk about whatever you wanted to talk to uh, talk about during the Q&A session. I would like to give the floor to Professor uh, Betul Dojan. Uh, so uh, Betul Dojan uh, is a PhD student, uh, and uh, she will be talking PhD in Gulf Studies within the Joint University of Qatar uh, Gulf Studies Center, University of Durham School of Government and International Affairs Program. She'll be talking about the assessment of Turkey's overseas military and political initiatives in the Gulf, Kuwait, and uh, Qatar. Uh, in the very last session of Gulf Forum, in the last speech, um, thank you for Doha Institute for accepting uh, many good papers and being here is a really nice opportunity to discuss, discuss with the colleagues. Um, just following the uh, Dr. Imad um, for Gulf-Turkey relations, uh, my focus is more uh, Kuwait and Qatar regarding the military initiatives uh, between two parties. This project is conducted by me and my colleague Hazal, uh, but she is based in Paris and she couldn't uh, be here to join me for the presentation. Uh, so I will start with the terminology. You can uh, see my presentation behind and then I will continue by motivation of both, both parties and I will uh, focusing on Qatar, then Kuwait, then finalize my assessment with the critical point. So during conceptualizing Turkey's role in the Gulf regarding its military uh, initiatives, the term we choose to use is military access. Uh, you can use also strategic access interchangeably with the concept. And this term refers to all types of bases facilities, including technical installations or overflight, uh, rights, port visit, any kind of military privileges a state is providing to another, including military training and trade and everything. So while talking about military access, you can be minimalized or maximize the relationship. If we say only, even if only one gun is between two states, is bought or sold, it's a military trade. If they do uh, cooperate heavily, it's also military access. So the term military access is really comprehensive and it is the one we have chose uh, for uh, our uh, paper. When it comes to military base, it refers more territorial privileges. So if a state is allowed to have exclusive extraterritorial control over another state's territory, it's a military base. You can use, again, military facility uh, as in interchangeably uh, for this terminology. So we are using neoclassical realism um, because we need a theory, theoretical understanding to evaluate Turkey's role in the Gulf, a military role, both including a foreign policy dynamic, domestic dynamic, and regional dynamics, including leaders' perception. So neoclassical realism is the one helps us to understand what is the impact of Erdogan, Emir Tamim, or Kuwaiti leaders, uh, or firm policy dynamics, or any other decision makings are done internally in Kuwait and Qatar, and internally in the Gulf political complex. So I will start with Turkey's motivations. Uh, our very first argument that Turkey's role in the Gulf is initiated for economic purposes. So it is a transformed process, starting by only economic and moving through social, political, and military aspect. So Turkey is a military exporting country, so military trade is a part of the motivation. Um, Turkey's regional isolation after the Arab Spring, or you can call it Prussia's lawlessness, as Ibrahim Kalan did, uh, as a Turkish representative. Turkey's um, 
role in the region as an isolated middle power after the Arab Spring, what happened between Emirat and Saudi Arabia and the Egypt. Uh, Turkey has tried to find a new road, a new places to cooperate politically, militarily, and economically. So Gulf is a really good uh, goal in this. The other aspect is the more active role in the region. So it's not only about Gulf. It's, only, it's about being active in firm policy making. And if you have Gulf countries who are potentially good allies, not only for military purposes, but also for economic purposes, more active being, the desire of being more active in the region provides the motivation for Turkey. My colleague uh, examined and discussed this strategic partnership between Gulf countries and Turkey heavily. So you have the background already. So this strategic partnership agreement between GCC and Turkey is really special when it comes to being only non-Gulf countries has this position as a first uh, country. And it refers not only for economic cooperation, even goes to intelligentsia sharing, social and cultural policies between uh, two parties. So what about GCC? Uh, we have been discussing security of the Gulf countries to yesterday and today. And many of our colleagues were criticized being more I mean, criticized for having more international dimension rather than having intra-Gulf security cooperation, intra-GCC security cooperation. But this is how they do in the GCC. They are not looking first to their neighbor, but to their international collaboration, <coughs> because the, the way they do international agreements, it's more transparent, more secured, and it is more powerful when it comes to securing yourself from your neighbor. It's an international situation, not only for the Gulf. So that's why GCC was in need to diversify its military trade. Even if the share of other parties are higher, GCC start looking for more parties, not only Turkey, but also China, Pakistan, and India are the new uh, batch of their allies. So the other <coughs> aspect is Iran. And when we talk about GCC security, it is impossible to talk about Iran. Um, Iran is in the Gulf not only with its political strategic importance, but also with its military power. So to mitigate Iran and its army, its military role, Turkish army is a good ideal to cooperate and to have a non-Arab but Muslim partner in the region. So when it comes to Turkish Gulf military cooperation before moving Qatar and Kuwait, um, there were already good relations all the time. But since, just like my colleague said, AK Party has started its initiative toward Middle East heavily because they were the one who has more potential positive feelings and projects to the Middle East. So Iraq war was one of the positions Turkey and the Gulf were in the same track on being anti-Iranian in Iraq. Then, then they had many, a lot of MAUs in 2005. It was the beginning of social and economic policy making, cooperating. Then we have strategic partnership agreement, which requires a special agreement among uh, countries and annual meetings. And um, I should definitely tell this, this wasn't an out of a sudden. It, it was a really gradual involvement of the Turkey to the Gulf. Started with Saudi and Emirati uh, partners in 1996, then Kuwait, then Bahrain, then Qatar and Oman. And, um, the first question needs to come to our minds is, is this a change in region's strategic map? When we have more Turkish military force or trade in the Gulf, there will be a change when it comes to geostrategic calculations, or it's just for here for more national, regional balance. Uh, we are going to discuss it in the last section. So beside all the critics and positive sides, we must be realistic that when it comes to Turkish army, it's uh, for Saudis, for Emiratis, for Kuwaitis, the old GCC partners, they know that it's a trustworthy partner, but there is also a threat, dilemma, because Turkey is somehow affecting their internal policy making, being a powerful, uh, trying to be a powerful uh, partner in the region. I want to see you this um, military trade uh, data from uh, Observatory of Economic Complexity from MIT. So the blue one, the shining blue from the 2008 till 2016, it is Emirat. So United Arab Emirates since uh, 2008 
was the biggest uh, collaborator with Turkish defense industry. And it was like that since 2000, uh, till 2016. But when it comes to 2016, the political conflict between United Arab Emirates and Turkey was bigger than any, I mean, previous ones, and they stopped renewing agreements. Uh, that's why when we calculate, the last section is for the total military trade between parties. So when you combine all the data for the last 10 years, United Arab Emirates has the highest score, and it is for 80 million US dollars. Then we have Saudi with 40 million US dollars. In this data, there's another point we need to see. Although Qatar and Turkey start having more military trade, it's not visible yet, because the agreements are done for coming two, three years. So the data will change in two years, which is not visible yet for 2019. The other aspect is Kuwait. Kuwait buys a, a really little amount of military equipment from Turkey, but they do it consistently. So even if they, they share is really limited, they are the most royal uh, partner to Turkey's defense industry. Um, then we need to mention another point. When I was in a conference in Cambridge, one of the other colleagues was presenting about Turkish uh, military base in Qatar, and the way she was presenting as if we have Turkish officers every corner in Qatar, like Turkish army, Turkish troops, it is not the case. The share of Turkey in GCC military trade and military presence is so limited. Because um, you can see here, Turkish, Turkey is a military exporter country as a raising power, but its share is still limited. There are European partners, US, Germany, uh, Denmark, sorry, Holland, uh, France, Britain, then we have even Asian powers, but Turkey is 14 all among the world. But when we check the GCC arms imports, which Saudi Arabia is the higher and the Emirate is the following one, and if you see the all Middle East arm imports, the amount that Turkey has, even the highest amount is $80 million, which is nothing comparing the whole share of military trade. So while talking about Turkey and its military role in the Gulf, we, we must definitely understand it's a limited power. It's not the way politicized and overread, overemphasized in the political scene. So you can see US Army has 12 military bases in the Gulf, naval and air base, and we have the biggest one in Qatar regarding the air force and the biggest one regarding the naval force in Bahrain. Uh, this is UK's uh, situation. They have Omani, Bahraini, and Qatari military base, and their uh, maritime presence is the longest, one of the longest one in the region because they were the colonial powers. Then we have France. Even last week, there was a new meeting between French and Qatari authority. They renewed their military agreement. We don't know the details, but they improved it somehow. So among all these European partners that they have military bases previously in the Gulf, and they have their military trade is really higher than Turkey, Although it's important to talk about Turkey, you must always keep in mind that it's really limited, limited comparing the other's role. So when it comes to Turkish military agreement with Qatar, uh, it started with a defense operation uh, and uh, military training agreement, then followed by a military base agreement and approved by the Turkish parliament. And there's a cases for this article referring that if any party is attacked, the other one is going to help. So that's why Turkish army was in the Qatari territory hours after the Gulf crisis happened. They have Supreme Strategic Committee, annual meeting, and under this committee there are many agreements, economic, social, political, and military, including the cooperation. This is the first military base Turkey had in Doha. I've been in this place, but they didn't allow me to put my picture. This is somebody else I took from uh, Google. And um, the, the name of the base is Tariq bin Ziyad. And it was only two container, maybe four rooms, not more than this. This was the first military base, and we had it in four years ago. Now we have another military base. They are not there anymore. They constructed a new one. And uh, it's air base, not ground forces. And there will be another one for the naval force in the north of Qatar. But any other detail about this basis, we don't know. So neither Turkish scholars nor international ones has no idea about it. It's not published. 
but the only picture we know from the previous one is this. And um, special modifications is done in uh, 2017. This villa was just next to my place in Doha, and the neighbor out of a sudden start putting all the pictures of Erdogan after the Gulf crisis, and this picture I took from, I think, Gulf Mall, the uh, Erdogan's was, his pictures was everywhere. So it became something different. You can call it more politicized, securitized, militarized, but it became definitely something different than it was in previously 2017. Then we have coup d'etat attempt in Turkey. Turkish people were in the street. Even in the day of Gulf crisis, they were in the street with the uh, Qatari flags. So although we are here talking about the limited military force, there is definitely more constructed, consciously constructed political and so social relations between two parties. And um, I must tell also, Turkish military base and military access in the region is more preemptive capacity. So if there's, it is just uh, for coming years and decades that Gulf will need more security calculations. Training is another um, part of the cooperation. Turkish army has been a part of training processes of Pakistani army, uh, many other Asian armies. So Qatar is one of them. Many Qatari officials are in Turkey to, Turk about, to learn about Turkey, to learn about more military details. Military trade is increased, as we talked before. So it's an it's a exchange of experience, basically. The last visit was for strategic committee in November, this November. And uh, Erdogan just said, the military trade and the cooperation between parties, yani Qatar and Turkey, serves for the stability and peace, not only for Qatar, but also for the Gulf. If you, co if you check the process after the Gulf crisis, if you see the uh, political conflict among Gulf countries, this statement doesn't, like, uh, doesn't seem like something true. Turkish military was based one of the reasons uh, for tension in the Gulf. And it doesn't look like helping for Gulf regional peace, but somehow, according to his speech and his political statement, this is one of the purposes for why Turkish army is located in, the, in Qatar. So when it comes to Kuwait, you can forget everything about we talked for Qatar. It's nothing like Qatar. In Kuwait, there is, nothing, uh, there is not a special military agreement. There is not a special military cooperation. Uh, they annually make defense plan, uh, and the last one was annual defense plan for 2019. But the way Kuwaiti uh, National News Agency declared it, it as if it was a special agreement, according to our reading in the paper, this is why NBC was in Kuwait and, talk, and they had a talk and disagreement about shared Hafshi and uh, Al Wafra oil reserves. So Kuwait basically just used the Turkey card uh, to Saudis to say that, see, if you're not happy with us, we have Turkish partners who are happy to be us with defense purposes. So defense plan for 2019 is nothing more than buying more weapons or exchanging information. But Kuwait and Turkey has good relations since 2017. So the assessment part, I am going to finalize what we have talked already. The arms transfer and base is a nexus. If you have military base in a country, you are going to make a political and military branding in the region. So why Turkish army is here, not only for political purposes, but the way they indicate their military force is going to bring a military trade branding to their uh, state. So it's economic, which is uh, understandable from a realist perspective. Kuwait and Qatar helped for um, Turkish lira. They officially declared their help. They economically helped. So Turkey is benefiting from this economic, uh, this military cooperation. Turkey is a NATO member, trustworthy army. So it is prestigious also for Qatar and Kuwait to have good relations with the NATO member regarding their military uh, cooperations. But um, since we saw in the Gulf crisis, uh, when it comes to being an ally with a non-Arab Muslim country, neither Turkey nor Iran is perceived as secured 100 percentage. So if, when we talk about French uh, military operation in Qatar, in Gulf, in their base in the United Arab Emirates, 
the amount of threat perception or the shape of threat perception is not the same with Turkey because Turkey is identified or constructed from another perspective. This is politics. And the relationship between uh, Erdogan and Tamim is really, really um, good, as we can see from the reports. So we can criticize the agreement and cooperation as personalized. If one of them is leaves the, from their position, maybe there won't be any more better relations because um, basically it is followed my uh, what we don't know part. We don't know any details of the agreement uh, regarding the budget, operating cost, transparency is not here, so we don't know to what extent Turkish role in the Gulf is a part of comprehensive grant strategy for basing diplomacy. And we don't know even uh, basic details, although we know the ones for American base and French base in Emirat or British base in, uh, in uh, Bahrain. So I also must tell you, uh, working on a military base and military cooperation is already by nature uh, comes with limitations. No one wants to talk about it, and neither military attention nor diplomats. But I tried and my colleague, we tried our best to uh, reach this assessment. And uh, thank you for your uh, presence in my presentation. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Batul, uh, for uh, a very informative uh, presentation. We have four uh, papers that have given us a lot uh, regarding uh, this particular uh, topic and subject. So let's open it for questions and answers. Uh, I see Dr. Abdullah. If I don't take him first, he's my colleague. And we went to college together. So it's a little bit uh, touchy. So, Abdullah, you get the first. Uh, I will, but then it doesn't turn on after that. <laughs> Try to manage. Working. Thank you. Shukran uh, al I enjoyed uh, listening, although it's too late in the day. In brief, we have a number of uh, comments. Uh, Mr. Minshawi, thank you for your presentation. It's very informative and straightforward and to the point. I have a few remarks. Uh, uh, do the Gulf countries have another ally in Washington other than Trump? Uh, if uh, Trump fails in 2020, what will happen to the uh, Gulf countries? Uh, and what is the issue about uh, the Qatar-UAE dispute and uh, row? We know that the UAE and Saudi Arabia are, uh, on the one hand, opposing Qatar. What is the image done to the image of the DCC and the think tanks? And how much money was uh, spent since the beginning of the Gulf? crisis. I'm not sure if you have the numbers. Uh, since uh, the beginning of the Gulf uh, crisis, of course, uh, uh, money uh, funneling has uh, dropped, but do you have exact figures about how much money was uh, spent? You also mentioned the Congress. Uh, in, 18, in 1988, uh, uh, Phillips uh, wrote the best money uh, Congress can uh, buy. And you are right in what you said. Uh, with money, you can even buy the Congress. What Congress? What role does the Congress has in foreign policy? Is it an impeding role? I'm not talking only about its role under Trump. Is it an impeding role or a facilitator of foreign policy? Dr. Elias, uh, 678 is about United Kuwait Nations liberation. United Security Council resolution was about Kuwait, uh, what, it was adopted uh, November 29th. It was over the giving the green light to proceed with all necessary means to liberate the state of Kuwait. What does it have to do with other uh, countries in the region? It doesn't uh, say anything about continuing using the United Nations Security Council and then Chapter 7 to use military power to resolve any dispute. <laughs> One last question uh, thank to you for Batul. Your presentation. If it weren't for the GCC crisis, what would have been Turkish role in the region? Thank you. Good questions. These are, you know, but I have you in the beginning. Uh, yes, okay, then uh, Dr. Misfer, I'll, I'll get you on Al-Khat. Yeah, Mia. 
Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Gaiti. Uh, so my question to Elias, yes, uh, please, yeah. You know, introduce yourself. I yeah, Samar Nasser. Bakur, research associate in Exeter University in, in London. Yeah, it's a pretty common, yeah, that the Authority of Security Council uh, was and is still, yeah, legislative, yeah, but it seems for the other countries, exec executive. Uh, I think recently that GCC has lost the trust with the Security Council, and I think the other ways around. For example, the Security Council lost the confidence yeah, and the trust yeah, for many examples. One, the use of force against region, regional countries. <laughs> yeah, regional countries, such as the uh, uh, Yemen war and the interference of Yemen. And the second example, the legislative role in preventing flights over some countries like yeah, Qatar. In the meantime, yeah, the, the uh, GCC lost the trust with Security Council in the meantime, yeah. Like, yeah, the quest for democratic, uh, democratic uh, securitization, yeah, in the Arab Gulf. And no support for maintenance, peace, and regional security. My point and my question is, do you think that losing mutual interest, yeah, and the mistrust between both organizations was a cause for that? Okay, thank you. Uh, then actually, al please, Dr. al -Masfer. Uh, Thank you. Actually, I have uh, two questions uh, to Mr. Mohammed al Manshawi about uh, the size of uh, Gulf spending in 2017. You said it was 56, and in 2018 it uh, dropped. So, what is the reason behind this uh, steep drop? In addition, the, you mentioned the Mueller report about the UAE meddling in the U.S. Uh, elections. To what extent could this uh, report uh, affect uh, uh, President uh, Trump's uh, position in the upcoming elections? In addition, you mentioned the Carter Doctrine or the Carter Statement. What about Nixon before Carter? And what about Johnson before that? What about Reagan? And what about their position on the Gulf security prior to Carter and Trump? And we know that they are mostly responsible for the current crisis that continue to simmer. Thank you. Please be brief. Uh, I have a straightforward question uh, for uh, Batum. To what extent could the Turkish public uh, perceive the Turkish military presence at the Gulf? Thank you. How does the Turkish public? Uh, yeah. uh, Sada? Yeah. Um, so, I have a first question to Dr. Muhammad. Dr. Muhammad, you spoke about uh, 35,000 U.S. soldiers uh, in the Gulf in times of peace. Does this mean a lack of a trust, or is it because security in the Gulf is fragile? We are talking about 35,000 soldiers in the Gulf in times of peace. Um, how does the United States see the uh, Turkish military existence in uh, the Gulf, and uh, how could uh, Qatar <coughs> manage and maintain balance between its interests with the United States and at the same time with the uh, military existence uh, of Turkey in the region? Thank you. Dr. Abdel Hadi. I would like to thank the uh, speakers. I have a question to Mr. Ahmad. My name is Muhammad bin Saud. I would like to ask you about the story of Muhammad bin Saud. Microphone. So the name is Muhammad bin Saud, and I ask you to check the reference. Uh, he spoke about uh, the founder of uh, Dawa. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's a fact check, no problem. Uh, 
for, uh, for, uh, for but all, all the information that you present show that it was in the interest of Turkey to ally with Saudi and with the United uh, Arab Emirates. So it's in their interest that Turkey is supposed to be on the other side. Why are they fitting with Qatar now, which is against their interest? Because something you did not mention, it's related to Egypt. And this is where Qatar fit exactly with the Turkish politics. That's dimension you didn't come across, which is something not related to the number that you showed. All the numbers you showed, suppose that Turkey now fighting strongly with in the, side, in the favor of the Saudi and but the other dimension that affect the whole pictures, which is an ideological position for the party and the whole conflict in Egypt and all the Arab siblings. I think that is a dimension you should come across Thank to understand you. it. Thank you. Okay, I think we, we've taken a lot of so we have taken a number of questions. It's time to listen to a number of answers. If we, uh, if we can have another round of uh, questions, then no problem. I would like to thank you all for your questions. Uh, I will uh, speak in brief because we do not have much time, but you can always ask me your questions after this session. Uh, the post-Trump era, I do not think that the uh, Gulf uh, relations with the US uh, depends on uh, Trump. It's uh, a long-standing alliance. Uh, this alliance has been ongoing under the Democrats, the Republicans, uh, the arms uh, sales. Uh, uh, have always been high regardless of who the president is. There's no difference if the president is Trump or Obama. So it's not about the personal uh, relationship with the president under uh, the uh, crown uh, prince. Uh, the relation was the same with both uh, Barack Obama and uh, Trump. Uh, and uh, so it's not about uh, the personal uh, or the, the president. We know that uh, most uh, democratic uh, presidential hopefuls uh, are uh, all very negative about uh, Saudi Arabia and the crown prince, and they have uh, this could be a concerning an alarm of uh, concern, uh, a cause for alarm. But I do not think they can become uh, enemies of uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so even if they criticize Saudi Arabia in the media, so I believe uh, there will not be a negative relationship after Trump with respect to the military. Uh, spending. This is the direct military spending. Uh, it's hard to measure the indirect military uh, spending because there are different uh, ways of uh, funding. As a, uh, an American national, I can get uh, tens of billions of dollars uh, from uh, Gulf uh, governments, and I can spend them on lobbying, and I also can um, uh, spend this money in different ways, and it's hard always to account for this uh, money. Uh, but uh, uh, the, um, some uh, research uh, centers uh, are transparent, others are not. Uh, the UAE has invested a lot in uh, renowned uh, centers uh, in uh, Washington, but uh, I uh, think uh, most uh, of this funding is undeclared and unannounced as in indirect, and uh, there are different ways uh, to spend the money inside uh, Washington. And outside Washington, it's uh, difficult to, to account for this uh, funding and spending. Uh, the role of the Congress is very important, uh, uh, but uh, as I've already said, the president should be aware uh, of the balance of uh, power, and uh, uh, there should not be the current state of uh, polarization. Uh, the Congress can control uh, the Department of State and uh, Defense, uh, but it can withhold uh, money. It can withhold the nomination of any ambassador. If the Congress is united, they can obstruct also the nomination of a president, and they can also also uh, um, impeach a president if they are united. In addition, the Congress abides uh, by the law. It's uh, the uh, legislative authority. It's a lawmaking authority. They adopted JAFTA uh, bill against uh, the funding of uh, terrorism. And the Democrat Obama uh, tried the uh, uh, to, uh, to obstruct it. And uh, he used his own veto power once. And also there are uh, uh, many, uh, so the Congress plays an important role if it's uh, united. The Mueller report 
I don't think that it will have any impact on President Trump. This is part of history now. Uh, the impeachment uh, will also fail 100%. The president will continue uh, his term, and we'll see what his fate will be. Uh, in the next presidential elections, it's at the state 50-50. Of course, uh, the relation uh, became stronger after World War II, and during World War II, the alliance exists, uh, but uh, the Carter uh, Doctrine was a critical point in the U.S. foreign policy. It was the first time that a U.S. Uh, President talked about the region that uh, the U.S. was ready to start a war to defend its interests, especially after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the Islamic Revolution. These were two major uh, determinants of the U.S. foreign policy. Of course, the relationship uh, existed under Eisenhower and uh, other presidents. So this was an alarming call for the Americans uh, that uh, the U.S. Uh, will step in to defend its interests. You mentioned 35,000 uh, uh, soldiers in times of peace. This is very uh, uh, telling. Uh, it's about uh, the efficiency and the capacity. and. Uh, uh, these two are two important factors. Uh, these are uh, documented. The uh, Yemen situation has uh, uh, revealed uh, how, the, uh, how the U.S. think uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia have the strongest weapon, the most powerful weapons, and they cannot uh, win a war that has been ongoing uh, for years. So this is the logic. If you have weapons, this does not necessarily mean that you can use uh, these weapons efficiently, as uh, some may think. In addition, there is the uh, uh, military manufacturing component that always, uh, uh, that always has an interest in ongoing uh, tension in uh, the Gulf. Uh, and we know like, that this will keep uh, the, uh, um, the U.S. Uh, companies working. This is not part of the conspiracy theory. Uh, another element uh, is uh, that you mentioned also about uh, funding for lobbies. Uh, actually, uh, the lobbies uh, spend a lot uh, to serve uh, the Gulf uh, interests and also the arms uh, sale. We are talking about deals uh, of $200 billion. And if they spend $10 billion, then this is not much uh, to compare. So they are working for uh, Gulf interests. So it's very important also to measure uh, this issue. One last point I want to make, it's about uh, the Gulf uh, countries. Uh, for years, uh, the Gulf countries have been calling for a written military uh, treaty or a pact with Washington, and Washington has been uh, rejecting this. Uh, the uh, Gulf countries exert uh, the intense uh, pressure, and they wanted to sign with Trump a written agreement similar uh, to, uh, so they wanted something in uh, writing because uh, the, uh, there is no uh, written agreement uh, on the military uh, presence. Uh, the uh, Gulf countries want this in writing. The U.S. is against it. Uh, thank you for the all questions. Um, one of the really, really impressive questions I had from Dr. Abdullah, what happens if we don't have Gulf crisis, the Turkish Gulf military cooperation? Um, I can start with um, very basic information. As we all know, Turkey was already in a conflict with Imara, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia because of the Egypt. Um, and there were already a tensioned relationship between partners. Uh, but what made Turkey's role more visible and prestigious on the eyes of Arab society and Turkish society is the way Turkey was benefited or used the opportunity of being in Qatar after the Gulf crisis. So Turkey saw the opportunity and they used it. Because the way they construct the foreign policy is not ideological. It's pragmatic, pure economic pragmatic. Uh, you can add this more social dimension, cultural dimension. And if you have more um, critical approach, you can criticize Erdogan's normative speech besides uh, his uh, pragmatic actions. But the way we read Turkish foreign policy in the paper is its pragmatic role in the region. So they, uh, following for the uh, Gulf crisis, there is a Kashikchi problem, right? So even if there won't be a crisis between Qatar and the rest of uh, Gulf countries, uh, Turkey's struggle with Saudi Arabia will be another option to feel more close to the Gulf, to, to Qatar. So I think there's already a problem in Syria, Yemen, which makes Turkey somehow 
diverse regarding its role in the region from United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Gulf crisis is just one of them. It is not the one, but it really helped because the way Turkish foreign policy is dedicated to being with Qatar was really uh, helpful uh, regarding to show its food security support and military support and social support to, uh, to Qatari people. And um, Turkish public, while working on this project, we have checked the Turkish parliamentary court on the day of agreement in 2014 and the, on the day of blockade, how Turkish parliamentary uh, members approached the uh, military base and troops uh, in the Gulf. Uh, Turkish parliament has basically two different groups, just like Turkish society, since the way of Turkish politics now, it wasn't like that previously. So if you are supporting national interests, according to group with Erdogan, you need to support Turkish military presence in the abroad. The society is in the same track. They see it as a branding and prestigious uh, Turkish tradition, being with the supporters and friends. And they see it a part of Turkish identity because Turkish society since 2000 years, army society, not only for men, also for women, Turkish society was constructed in a way of being good in military. So that's why half of the society and parliament is happy about it. But the other rest is <coughs> heavily criticizing this. And they, the way they, um, the way they create the narrative, <coughs> they say we already have economic problems. We have already social problems after the coup d'etat. What we are doing in Qatar out of nowhere, we have no idea. So this part of the society is criticizing state depending the money for a military operation, not only for Qatar, also in Syria. And uh, they feel they are more European. They are not with Arabs. So why we are with them in the Middle East to support Arab people, although we are from Europe. So it's a typical Turkish disagreement on the way of construction of state society relations and foreign policy making. So it's just a simple uh, basic difference in the society. And um, what about Turkey-US relations? As we said before, Turkey is a NATO member, so decisions of army and military uh, trades are done under the international uh, international uh, rules and norms with NATO. So what Turkey is doing in Qatar is definitely according to rules of NATO. In this regard, US wasn't anti of this. And as you can see in the Gulf crisis, although one of the demands in the Turkey list of demands was closure of Turkish army, Tillerson never talked about it. They never said, yes, you should definitely close the military base. They didn't say we are supporting it. But they didn't say, yes, we are not agree with it. Because Turkey is in the bigger umbrella of the Western military cooperation, is a part of US military presence, rather than uh, the other side, like China and Russia. So, um, and the last part, I definitely agree to you, uh, uh, Mr. Abdullah. Uh, Egypt and Muslim Brotherhood is the biggest reason how Turkey and Qatar was together, and it is the biggest reason why Emirat and Turkey was in the different parts. But I don't agree with you in regard of ideology. The way we read Turkish foreign policy is not ideologically driven. We see it is more economically and politically pragmatist to increase the l role of national interest uh, in foreign policy making. If Saudis and Emiratis were happy Turkish role in Egypt, there won't be any problem. And uh, even after Kashikchi, uh, there was a really important military exhibition in Saudi Arabia, and Turkish military defense industry was the biggest uh, branding, the, the biggest branding campaign, and Saudi troops were in Turkey to be educated. So we can see political narratives really, really um, aggressive in the newspapers. But why Tur Saudi troops are in Turkey then? It was 2018, after Kashikchi. So even in the case of Egypt, I think things won't stay like that because Turkey doesn't need only Muslim Brotherhood, but other allies to continue its national security and economic diversification in regard of uh, national interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please. So I'll start with the last question. Um, I'm not an international relations specialist, but my, my impression is that the, the Security Council doesn't look at um, alliances or international organizations 
in the same way that states do. They, they, they see them because the Security Council is composed of the various states, and the various states have their own um, points of view and their own alliances, but they see international organizations from the point of view if they can assist regional peace and security. So, you know, we have a number of ECOWAS, for example, does all the dirty work for the Security Council in Africa. Uh, uh, the Pakistani army as well is involved in a number of operations across the world, um, as well as uh, regional Latin American um, uh, military alliances, and NATO as well for, for others. But for the GCC, I don't think they have a strong point of view. That's my impression. I don't think they have a strong point of view of the, of the GCC because it's not really a strong organization. It doesn't do much in terms of regional peace and security, uh, uh, deploy force and so forth. Um, for the Resolution 678, from the moment it was adopted, there are two strands. So it says the mem authorized member states to use all necessary means to oust um, Saddam Hussein from, from Kuwait, and secondly, to restore international peace security in the region. And by region, they mean the entire Gulf. And so one of the big problems that's happened in this is that because the resolution is out, and because every country can then issue a veto in the Security Council, there can be no other resolution which will kind of uh, decrease both the spatial ambit of the resolution and also the geographical uh, ambit of the resolution. No one can do that. So they're really stuck with it. And that's why the Security Council, when they authorize, for example, no-fly zones in, uh, in northern Iraq, when they authorize interdiction of shipping in the Gulf, they always also rely, on, among other issues, on Resolution 678. And every American international law scholar, but everyone in Europe as well, without any, you know, without any exception, they always say that the Resolution 678 is the basis for a future intervention in Iran, but also any future intervention of, uh, of uh, the Security Council and whoever wants to participate within, uh, within the Gulf region as well. And that's exactly why the Americans did not try to go for Article 51 intervention when they could, because they had an invitation from the Kuwait government, but they waited another extra month because they knew that because of the alliances in the Security Council, they would be able to, to get this resolution passed by. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, and the principal name is Abdullah ibn Saud ibn Muhammad. Abdullah ibn, ibn Saud ibn Muhammad. Okay. Uh, 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 صحيح هناك يعني تعاون عسكري وهي ممكن أن تكون رسالة للسعودية لكن يجب أن لا نبسط الأمور إلى هذه الدرجة بخصوص إنه الكويت تستعين بتركيا يعني يعني بين قوسين ضد ال against the Saudis between brackets uh, because uh, Kuwait uh, agreed uh, with KSA on uh, different uh, regional uh, causes uh, or ties in the year 2013 uh, for example uh, um, there's an example uh, to this and it supports uh, lots of uh, KSA uh, policies uh, and in what concerns uh, the war on Yemen uh, Turkey now is uh, trying to really uh, show it as if there should be a political settlement and a humanitarian relief uh, and it went far away uh, from the uh, logistic and military support uh, to the coalition. This is uh, the vision uh, towards uh, Kuwait. Kuwait also looks uh, at uh, Turkey in uh, a dual manner. It can benefit from it uh, and it can uh, also uh, add uh, military contributions, especially uh, that uh, the military uh, manufacturing in Turkey today is witnessing a very rapid growth, so it can be an extra resource for Kuwait uh, but uh, it's not necessary for uh, the Turkey Oman رؤية تركيا إلى عمان هي ضمن السياسة الدكتور عبد الله الغيلاني من الناس من يعني من الخبراء الذين قابلتهم في هذا الموضوع كذلك الدكتور عبد الله بعبود وأفادونا طبعا بالإضافة إلى باحث آخر يعني الرؤية هي تنظر إليها لأنها دولة إسلامية شقيقة يمكن تطوير العلاقات معها لكن لا تنظر إلى مسألة يعني علاقة خاصة أو شراكة استراتيجية تنم عن بعد عسكري أو أمني سياسة عمان متوازنة في هذا في هذا الشأن لكن المهم هنا 
هي نظرة تركيا إلى عمان التصريحات العمانية قليلة جدا جدا تجاه رؤية تركيا لكن عمان السفير التركي في عمان شدد في تصريح طويل يعني على انه على موقع عمان الاستراتيجي وعلى اهميه الشراكه الاستراتيجيه مع عمان بمعنى اخر ان تركيا مع السياسات الحاليه التي يعني اللي هي تقريبا ممكن نسميها اجريسيف بوليسي تجاه المنطقه بعمومها تتطلع مستقبلا ليس هناك تصريح معين لكن يمكن ان يستشف من تاكيدها على موقع عمان الاستراتيجي انه ممكن عمان في اي وقت من الاوقات ان تكون ذات علاقه خاصه وممكن ان يكون تعاون عسكري معها وحبذا طبعا لو كان هناك قاعده عسكريه او كذا يعني فعمان ضمن النظره التركيه في المستقبل يمكن تطوير علاقات خاصه معها شكرا شكرا لك احنا الوقت انتهى و فساعتذر من البقيه والطاقه كمان نزلت انا بشوف فاعتذر من البقيه اللي كانوا حابين يسالوا يستمر النقاش بعدها اشكر كل المتحدثين والمتحدثه على مشاركتهم ومساهمتهم والى اللقاء في يوم اخر